Thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. If you have not, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight, where we have some amazing merch and plenty of other things for you guys. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. To finish the fight, a gaming podcast where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall, and I am your host, Derek Baker. And today we're going back to where it started, but not where it started. We're going back to like further down, Leon's involved. It's a whole thing. Of course, we're talking about Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 is super iconic. Coming out for just the GameCube was sort of a weird twist of fate, I think, for this series, which I think just makes it a little bit more interesting and stood out to me a little bit more as a game because I was always a Nintendo player growing up, Mm -hmm. had the NES, skipped the SNES, had the N64, and of course had the GameCube um, and all the consoles afterwards, minus the Wii U, of course, because who had a Wii U other than Alex? But <laughs> yeah, me. I digress. Love Resident Evil 4. As always, excited to talk about this one. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll get into it. We'll kind of talk about the difference that 4 brought to kind of the Resident Evil era and the survival kind of horror genre era of the time. And so Resident Evil 4 is a survival horror game by Capcom, originally released for the GameCube in 2005. Players control the special agent Leon S. Kennedy on a mission to rescue the U.S. president's daughter, Ashley Graham who has been kidnapped by a religious cult in rural Spain. Leon fights hordes of enemies inflicted by a mind-controlling parasite and reunites with the spy, Ada Wong. In a departure from the fixed camera angles and slower gameplay of previous Resident Evil games, Resident Evil 4 features a dynamic camera system and action-oriented gameplay. Development on Resident Evil 4 began for the PlayStation 2 in 1999. Four proposed versions were discarded. The first was directed by Hideki Kamiya, but series creator Shinji Mikami felt it was too great a departure from the previous games, so it was spun off as Devil May Cry. Other versions were scrapped until Mikami took directorial duties for what became the final version. The game was announced as part of the Capcom 5, a collaboration between Capcom and Nintendo to create five exclusives for the GameCube. Resident Evil 4 garnered acclaim for its story, gameplay, graphics, voice acting, and characters, and is cited as one of the best video games of all time, winning multiple Game of the Year awards in 2005. It was ported to numerous formats and became a cross-platform hit, selling 12.3 million units by December 2022. It influenced the evolution of the survival horror and third-person genres popularizing the -the over-the-shoulder third-person view used in games such as Gears of War, Dead Space, and The Last of Us. Its successor, Resident Evil 5, was released in 2009, and, as we all know, a remake of Resident Evil 4 was released in 2023. Now, as we know, this game was made by Capcom Limited, and it is a Japanese video game company, and it has created a number of multi-million selling game franchises, with its most commercially successful being Resident Evil, Monster Hunter, Street Fighter, Mega Man, Devil May Cry, Dead Rising, Ace Attorney, and Marvel vs. Capcom. Mega Man himself serves as the official mascot of the company, Established in 1979, it has become an international enterprise with subsidiaries in East Asia in Hong Kong, Europe in London, England, and North America, located in San Francisco, California. Now let's talk a little bit about the development of Resident Evil 4. In 1999, 
producer Shinji Mikami said a Resident Evil sequel was in development for the PS2. Resident Evil 4 underwent a lengthy development, during which at least four versions of the game were discarded. The first version was directed by Hideki Kamiya. Around the turn of the millennium, Resident Evil 2 writer Noboru Sugimura created a story for the game, based on Kamiya's idea to make a cool and stylish action game. The story was based on unraveling the mystery surrounding the body of the protagonist, Tony, an invincible man with skills and an intellect exceeding that of normal people, with his superhuman abilities explained with biotechnology. As Kamiya felt the playable character did not look brave and heroic enough in battles from a fixed angle, he decided to drop the pre-rendered backgrounds from previous installments and use a dynamic camera system. The team spent 11 days in the United Kingdom and Spain, photographing objects such as gothic statues, bricks, and stone pavements for use in textures. Though the developers tried to make the coolness theme fit into the world of Resident Evil, Mikami felt it strayed too far from the series' survival horror roots and gradually convinced the staff to make an independent game. This became a new Capcom franchise, Devil May Cry, released for the PlayStation 2 in August of 2001. So kind of the first of those kind of four versions that we have I want to talk about is the Fog version, and development on Resident Evil 4 restarted at the end of 2001. The first announcement was made in November 2002 as one of five games exclusively developed for the GameCube by Capcom Production Studio 4, the Capcom 5. This revision, commonly dubbed the Fog version, was directed by Hiroshi Shibata and was 40% finished at that time. The game saw Leon S. Kennedy struggling to survive after having infiltrated Umbrella's castle-like main headquarters located in Europe and featured traditional Resident Evil monsters such as zombies. During the course of the new story, which was again written by Sugimura's scenario creation company flagship, Leon became infected with the progenitor virus and possessed a hidden power in his left hand. The producer of the final version also pointed out that Ashley did not appear back then, though there was a different girl who was never revealed to the public. The game was to feature some first-person elements. There was also the Hookman version, and at E3 2003, Capcom showcased a version widely known as the Hookman version. It was later titled Moborushi no Biohazard 4, a.k.a. The Phantom Biohazard 4, on the Biohazard 4 secret DVD. During Mikami's introduction of the trailer, he assured the development was proceeding smoothly and claimed the game was scarier than ever before. The story was set in a haunted building where Leon contracted a bizarre disease and fought paranormal enemies, such as animated suits of armor, living dolls, and a ghost-like man armed with a large hook. The game had an otherworldly feel to it, containing elements like flashbacks and hallucinations that were marked by a bluish tint and a shaking camera. It also displayed various gameplay mechanics that carried over to the final release, like the -the over-the-shoulder camera, a laser sight for aiming in battles and quick-time events. Other features, such as dialogue choices, were removed later. Five minutes of gameplay footage were released on the Biohazard 4 Secret DVD, a Japanese pre-order bonus given out in January 2005. The third of these was the hallucination version, which had only a basic story concept, having dropped the previous scenario penned by Noburo Sugimura of Flagship. In 2012, Resident Evil 3 nemesis scenario writer Yasuhisa Kawamura said he was responsible for this version, as he wanted to make Biohazard 4 scarier and, quote, suggested using a particular scene from the film Lost Souls, where the main character suddenly finds herself in a derelict building with a killer on the loose. An arranged version of this idea eventually turned into Hookman. The idea went through several iterations as Mr. Sugimura and I carefully refined this world, which, I have to say, was very romantic. Leon infiltrates the castle of Spencer seeking the truth, while inside a laboratory located deep within, a young girl wakes up. Accompanied by a B.O.W. dog, which was an abbreviation for bio-organic weapon in the series lore, the two start to make their way up the castle. 
Unfortunately, there were many obstacles that needed to be overcome, and the cost of development was deemed too expensive. End quote. Kawamura added he was very sorry and even ashamed that Mikami had to step in and scrap this version. After this attempt, the last cancelled revision featured classic zombies again. However, it was discontinued after a few months, and before it was ever shown to the public, as the developers felt it was too formulaic. The story of the progenitor virus was eventually covered in Resident Evil 5, and the Spencer Estate became the setting for Resident Evil 5's DLC pack, Lost in Nightmares, featuring Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine. And then, of course, there was the final version, which following all of that, it was decided to reinvent the series. Mikami took over directorial duties from Shibata and began working on the version that was released. In an interview with Game Informer, Mikami explained his decision to shift to a new gameplay system was due to the feeling that the older system is more of the same after playing Resident Evil Zero. He says that he only felt nervous once more when playing with the newer system. Speaking for the team, game producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi mentioned how the staff was tired of the same thing and how some got bored and moved on to other projects. In addition to that, the producer also felt that the older format was stuck in a cookie-cutter mold and described it as shackles holding us down. However, some of the other staff members disagreed about changing the gameplay system. These members felt depressed and were hard to motivate after the game's focus shifted to be more action-oriented. Although Mikami demanded the camera system be revised, the team had reservations about making big changes to the series he had created. Eventually, he intervened, explained his proposed changes, and wrote a new story that, unlike previous installments, was not centered on the company umbrella. Mikami wrote the entire story in just three weeks due to time constraints. Inspired by Onimusha 3 Demon Siege, a game Mikami had enjoyed playing but felt could have been better with a different view, he decided to place the camera behind the playable character. To go along with the new gameplay and story, a new type of enemy called Ganado was created, as opposed to using the undead creatures from previous Resident Evil games. Furthermore, producers expended additional detail to modify and update characters that had previously appeared in the series. In a documentary explaining the conception of the characters, Kamiya stated he intended to make Leon Kennedy look tougher, but also cool. Kobayashi was responsible for the design of some of the final game's enemies, such as the Regenerators. Kobayashi described the creature's origins within universe lore as byproducts of Los Illuminados research into bioorganic weapons, malformed creations implanted with multiple plaga parasites during the experimentation process. Regenerators are designed to take distinct heavy breaths before they are seen, which alerts the player to their presence. When encountered, often in small confined spaces, they would walk slowly towards the player character. The regenerator is capable of continuously regenerating itself and cannot easily be dispatched unless the player is able to find the plague of parasites within its body, which can only be seen with the infrared scope and specifically target them first. During an interview with Famitsu, Mikami explained that elements like the regenerators help maintain the survival horror aspect of Resident Evil 4 as a balance between a scary kind of gameplay and the challenge of overcoming that fear, with the goal of giving players a sense of achievement when they manage to overcome the monster. The English voice actors recorded their parts in four sessions over three to four months. Capcom assigned Shinsaku Ohara as script translator and voiceover coordinator. Carolyn Lawrence, who provided the voice for Ashley Graham, described her character as vulnerable because Leon has to come to her rescue all the time. She also described Kennedy's character as more brawn, perhaps, than brain. In addition to the voice acting, the game's designer detailed each cinematic sequence so that each character's facial expressions match the tone of their voice actor. Along with Resident Evil Dead Aim and Resident Evil Outbreak, two side story games that did not fall under the exclusive policy, it was announced on October 31, 2004, 
that Resident Evil 4 would come to the PlayStation 2 in 2005, citing increased profit, changing market conditions, and increased consumer satisfaction as the key reasons. The PS2 version included new features, primarily a new sub-game featuring Ada Wong. On February 1, 2006, Ubisoft announced that they would be publishing the game on the PC for Windows. On April 4, 2007, a Wii version was announced that was launched later in the year. The game features all of the extras in the PS2 version along with other additions, including a trailer for Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles. Now, it's what we're all here for. Let's talk about the story of Resident Evil 4 and their kind of delineation away from Umbrella. In 2004, U.S. government agent Leon S. Kennedy is on a mission to rescue Ashley Graham, the U.S. president's daughter, who has been abducted by a mysterious cult. He travels to an unnamed rural village in Spain, where he encounters a group of hostile villagers who pledge their lives to Los Luminados, the cult that kidnapped Ashley. The villagers were once simple farmers until becoming infected by a mind-controlling parasite known as Las Plagas. While in the village, Leon is captured by its chief, Vitrez Mendez, and injected with Los Plagas. He finds himself held captive with Luis Serra, a former police officer in Madrid and former Los Illuminados researcher. The two work together to escape, but soon go their separate ways. Leon finds out Ashley is being held in a church and rescues her. They both escape from the church after Osman Sadler, the leader of Los Illuminados, reveals his plan to use the parasite they injected into Ashley to manipulate her into injecting the President of the United States with a sample once she returns home, allowing Sadler to begin his conquest of the world. After killing Mendez, Leon and Ashley try to take refuge in a castle, but are attacked by more Illuminados under the command of Ramon Salazar, another of Sadler's henchmen who owns the castle, and the two become separated by Salazar's traps. Meanwhile, Luis searches for pills that will slow Leon and Ashley's infection, as well as a sample of Las Plagas. He brings the two items to Leon but is killed by Sadler, who takes the sample while the pills to suppress the infection remain in Leon's hands. While in the castle, Leon briefly encounters Ada Wong, a woman from his past who supports him during his mission. He battles his way through the castle before killing Salazar. Afterward, Leon travels to a nearby island research facility where he continues the search for Ashley. He discovers that one of his former training comrades, Jack Krauser, who is believed to have been killed in a helicopter crash two years prior, is responsible for her kidnapping in an attempt to get close enough to Sadler to steal his new Plagueis sample. Ada and Krauser are working with Albert Wesker, for whom both intend to secure a Plagueis sample, though Krauser is suspicious of Ada. Suspicious of the mercenary's intentions, Sadler orders Krauser to kill Leon, believing that no matter which one dies, he will benefit. After Krauser's defeat, Leon rescues Ashley, and they remove the Plagueis from their bodies using a specialized radiotherapeutic device. Leon confronts Sadler and with Ada's help, manages to kill him. However, Ada takes the sample from Leon at gunpoint before escaping in a helicopter, leaving Leon and Ashley to escape via her jet ski as the island explodes. Now, as we talked about, there's a number of ports, release versions, everything. Let's talk about a couple of them today. The original version for the GameCube featured two different collector's editions. The first was available as a pre-order that included the game, the prologue art book, and a t-shirt. GameStop offered another limited edition that was packaged in a tin box with the art book, a cell of Leon, and a soundtrack CD. Australia received an exclusive collector's edition that came with the game and a bonus disc with interviews and creator's footage. Resident Evil 4 was ported to the PlayStation 2 after Capcom stated that it did not fall under the exclusivity deal with Nintendo. It was released in North America on October 25, 2005. The largest edition is Separate Ways, a new scenario for Ada written by Haru Murata. According to producer Masachika Kawada, the Separate Ways campaign was something thought up by the PS2 porting team and was added after getting approval from Shinji Mikami. The port was later included with Code Veronica X and Resident Evil Outbreak as part of the compilation Resident Evil The Essentials. 
the PlayStation 2 version featured two standard and collector's bundles from pre-orders. The standard package included the game and a t-shirt, while the collector's bundle also included a figurine of Leon and the soundtrack Biohazard Sound Chronicle Best Track Box. This quickly sold out, and a second pressing was released that included an Ada figure, and another, called the Resident Evil 4 Premium Edition, was packaged in a steelbook media case along with the art book, a documentary DVD, and a cell art of Ada. A PC port of Resident Evil 4 developed by SourceNext was released in Hong Kong on February 1, 2007, published by Typhoon Games. It was released in Europe, North America, and Australia in March 2007, and was published by Ubisoft. The port contains the bonus features from the PS2 version, such as Separate Ways, the PRL-412 Laser Cannon, and a second set of unlockable costumes for Leon and Ashley, as well as an easy difficulty level. It also supports multiple widescreen resolutions. The shadow and lighting problems were fixed in the only patch, version 1.10. Resident Evil 4 Wii Edition was released for the Wii on May 31, 2007 in Japan, and on June 19, 2007 in the United States. It features updated controls that utilize the pointing and motion sensing abilities of the Wii Remote and Nunchuck though both the GameCube controller and the Classic controller are also supported. The Wii Remote is able to aim and shoot anywhere on the screen with a reticle that replaces the laser sight found in the other versions, and motion-based gestures are used to perform some context-sensitive actions, such as dodging or slashing. The Wii Edition also includes the extra content from the PS2 and PC versions, and a trailer for Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles. The Wii edition became available for download from the Wii U's Nintendo eShop in Europe on October 29, 2015. Resident Evil 4 Mobile Edition was released in Japan for Oz Brew 4.0 on February 1, 2008. It was announced by Capcom at TGS 2007. Differences from the original include changing the flow of the story from being continuous to being divided into sections such as Village, Ravine, Fortress, and Subterranean Tunnel. There is also a more challenging mercenary mode. The game uses the Mascot Capsule Eruption Engine and was adapted to the Zebo and iOS platforms. On July 13th, 2009, without any formal announcement, Resident Evil 4 Mobile Edition was released by Capcom for the iOS platform via the App Store in Japan, but was quickly removed, though some players were able to purchase and download it. The game has since been released in Japan and North America. Later, Capcom made an update that had different difficulty levels and high scores. Capcom released a new, separate version called Resident Evil 4 for beginners, which offers the first two levels, three, counting a training level, of both story mode and mercenary mode. However, the rest of the levels are available for purchase in-game as DLC. Due to the release of the iPad, Capcom recreated the iPhone version of Resident Evil 4 Mobile Edition and updated it to HD graphics as Resident Evil 4 iPad Edition. On March 23, 2011, high-definition remastered versions of both Resident Evil Code Veronica and Resident Evil 4 were announced to be in development for the Xbox 360 and PS3 as part of the Resident Evil Revival Selection series. The ports feature all the bonus content from the previous releases, including separate waves. On July 23, 2011, Capcom announced at Comic-Con 2011 that Resident Evil 4 would be released on September 20th for the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live games on demand. In Japan, Resident Evil 4 and Code Veronica were released on a single disc with the title Biohazard Revival Selection on September 8, 2011. For North America and Europe, both games, including Resident Evil 4 HD, were only released as DLC on Xbox and PlayStation Network. On February 27, 2014, Capcom released Resident Evil 4 Ultimate HD Edition for Windows, and the port features improved graphics and many other enhancements that were included in Resident Evil 4 HD, and finally, Resident Evil 4 was re-released on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One on August 30th, 2016. In April 2013, Resident Evil 4 was released on Android, but outside of Japan, it is exclusive to Samsung through Samsung Galaxy Store. 
Capcom announced in October 2018 that Resident Evil 4 would be published for the Nintendo Switch sometime in 2019, along with releases of Resident Evil and Resident Evil Zero. All three games were released on May 21st, 2019 worldwide, and on May 23rd, 2019 in Japan. In October 2021, Capcom released a virtual reality version of Resident Evil 4 for the Oculus Quest 2. Developed by the American Armature Studio, many elements of gameplay like combat and inventory management were changed to accommodate VR. This version, which runs on Unreal Engine 4, also includes redesigned textures with increased resolution. The VR version was heavily criticized by fans, both in Japan and the West, due to Armature Studios' censorship of content. The developers and executive producer Tom Ivey, who stated that the changes were made to quote, update the game for a modern audience, removed a number of in-game animations such as the animation triggered when players attempted to look up Ashley's skirt, and dialogue and flirtatious banter between characters. Some of these changes were made at the expense of continuity and context in cutscenes as central to the game's plot. The controversy continued when in April 2022, the VR version's executive producer Tom Ivey stood by the changes. Quote, I definitely agree with the changes we made to the game, so we're definitely on board with that. We think it's the right thing. Biohazard 4 original soundtrack was released in Japan on December 22, 2005. It contains 62 compositions from the game and the 48-page visual booklet with liner notes from composers Shusaku Uchiyama and Misao Simbangi. Other merchandise included figures by McFarlane Toys, NECA, and Hot Toys. Agatsuma Entertainment has also created various miniature collectibles based on several main characters and enemies from Resident Evil 4. Two special controllers designed to resemble chainsaws were designed by Nubitech for use with the GameCube and PlayStation 2 versions. Now, as we're coming to a close of the episode, let's talk about the reception of the game. The GameCube and PlayStation 2 versions of Resident Evil 4 have a score out of 96 out of 100 on Metacritic, indicating universal acclaim. These versions are ranked in the top two on Metacritic's list of the best video games for 2005. In addition to the gameplay, the characters and story received positive commentary, leading to the finished product being deemed by most as one of the best video games ever made. GameSpot's Greg Kasavin praised the voice acting, but claimed that it was betrayed by some uncharacteristically goofy dialogue. Yahoo Games' Adam Pavlaka and GameSpot's Kevin Venord acclaimed Capcom for adding great amounts of detail to the characters. IGN's Matt Casamassina went into further detail in his review for Resident Evil 4, praising not only the detailed character design, but also the fight choreography and three-dimensional modeling within cinematic sequences. Casamassina also complimented the voice actors, especially Paul Mercier, who played Leon, commenting, For once, the characters are believable because Capcom has hired competent actors to supply their voices. Leon in particular is very well produced. IGN and Nintendo Power specifically recognized Resident Evil 4's character design and voice acting. The increased variety of weapons has been praised by gaming publications such as Game Pro and Game Over Online. G4 TV show X-Play gave it a 5 out of 5, for introducing a new style of gameplay for the series, as well as incorporating moments where the player would have to interact with the cutscenes. Not long after, it was awarded as the best game ever reviewed on the show. The makers of Resident Evil 4 worked on various innovations associated with the use and inventory of weapons. Game Over stated that players can use the vast array of weapons to go for headshots now. Game Informer stated that ammunition is more plentiful in Resident Evil 4 than in other games in the series, making it more action-oriented. The ratings of the PC port, along with the Ultimate HD Edition release, were not as high as for the other versions. The original PC port was criticized for no mouse support and frustrating keyboard controls, low-quality FMV cutscenes, and choppy lighting graphics rendering. Despite these problems, it received generally positive reviews from critics, 
including IGN and GameSpot that praised the gameplay, character models and environments, and sound design. Game Revolution referred to the game's Ultimate HD Edition as a bare-bones port of a nonetheless spectacular game, noting minor superficial alterations similar to the 2007 PC port and asserting that the true Ultimate Edition of Resident Evil 4 is the Wii version. Japanese game magazine Famitsu reviewed the Wii version, with two editors giving it a perfect 10 score, and the remaining pair giving it a 9, resulting in a score of 38 out of 40. The reviewers felt that the new controls offered something fresh. Multiple reviewers agreed that even those who own the original will find something fun and enjoyable in that new version. British magazine Endgamer gave the Wii edition a score of 96%, slightly lower than the 97% given to the GameCube version. They praised the visuals, controls, and features and commented on the fact that such an exceptional package was on sale for a low price. However, when writing about the Wii controls, they said, quote, If you've played the GC version, this won't be as special. Official Nintendo Magazine gave the Wii version 94%, 3% less than the original, due to it simply not having the same impact it did back then. In 2009, they went on to place the game ninth of the list of the greatest Nintendo games of all time. IGN praised the Wii version, stating it is the superior edition, but does not push the Wii like it did with GameCube and PS2. GameSpot praised the new controls of the Wii edition, but commented on the lack of exclusive Wii features. Hyper's Jaunty Davies, commended Resident Evil 4 Wii Edition for its visual improvements, but criticized it for having no new content. The PS3 version of Resident Evil 4 HD received a score of 9 from Destructoid, which called it a hallmark of excellence. In their October 2013 issue, Edge retroactively awarded it 10 out of 10. Resident Evil 4 is considered one of the best video games of all time. It is included in the 1001 Video Games You Must Play Before You Die book, Nintendo Power ranked it as number one in their list of the top 25 best GameCube games of all time in 2005, and also ranked it second on their list of the best games of the 2000s in 2010. In 2008, Resident Evil 4 was ranked first place in the list of the best video games of all time, according to the readers of IGN, and sixth place in the list of best PS2 games of all time, according to IGN staff. In 2021, IGN ranked the game as the 40th best game of all time, and in 2009, Game Informer ranked Resident Evil number one on their list of the top GameCube games and number three on their list of the top PlayStation 2 games. Resident Evil 4 is regarded as one of the most influential, as we've been saying, influential and the best games of the 2000s particularly due to its influence in redefining the third-person shooter genre by introducing offset camera angles that do not obscure action. The new gameplay alterations and immersive style appealed to many not previously familiar with the series. The -the over-the-shoulder viewpoint introduced in Resident Evil 4 has later become standard in third-person shooters and action games, including titles ranging from Gears of War to Batman Arkham Asylum. It has also become a standard precision aim feature for third-person action games in general, with examples including Dead Space, Grand Theft Auto, Ratchet & Clank Future, Fallout, Uncharted, Mass Effect, and The Last of Us. In 2019, Game Informer called Resident Evil 4 the most important third-person shooter ever and said it innovated two genres, inspiring developers of both survival horror and shooter games. Resident Evil 4 redefined the survival horror genre by emphasizing reflexes and precision aiming, thus broadening the gameplay of the series with with elements from the wider action game genre. However, this also led some reviewers to suggest that the Resident Evil series had abandoned the survival horror genre by demolishing the genre conventions that it had established. Other major survival horror series followed suit, by developing their combat systems to feature more action, such as Silent Hill Homecoming and the 2008 version of Alone in the Dark. These changes represent an overall trend among console games, shifting toward visceral action gameplay. While working on The Last of Us, Naughty Dog took cues from Resident Evil 4, particularly the tension in action. 
Dead Space designers Ben Wamut and Wright Bagwell stated that their game was originally intended to be System Shock 3 before the release of Resident Evil 4 inspired them to go back to the drawing board. Bioshock was also influenced by Resident Evil 4, including its approach to the environments, combat, and tools, its game design and tactical elements, its gameplay-fueled storytelling and inventory system, and its opening village level in terms of how it handled the sandbox nature of the combat and in terms of the environment. Bloodborne's environments, enemy design, and shift to a faster combat system compared to previous Souls-like games was influenced by Resident Evil 4. Corey Barlog cited Resident Evil 4 as an influence on the God of War series, including God of War 2, which was released in 2007, and particularly God of War, In 2018, the revamp, which was influenced by Resident Evil 4's combination of poised camera exploration and scavenging. Uncharted director Bruce Straley called the Resident Evil 4 Village sequence the best opening fight in a video game. Resident Evil Village is heavily influenced by Resident Evil 4, with its own director stating, quote, If Resident Evil 7 was like a reboot that inherited the DNA of the original Resident Evil, then you could say that this time, we're doing the same for Resident Evil 4. We've designed the game and its structure with Resident Evil 4's essence in mind. The combat and sound design of the Regenerator and its spike-laden Iron Maiden variant have often been lauded as a memorable horror element of Resident Evil 4 in spite of the game's more action-oriented gameplay compared to its predecessors. Some critics have included the Regenerator in retrospective top lists of the scariest or most memorable monsters in video games. The Regenerators and the Plague of Parasite serve as sources of inspiration for the development of the necromorph monsters from Dead Space. And finally, Venture Beat credits Resident Evil 4 with popularizing video game remastered editions, inspiring remasters including Grand Theft Auto V, Tomb Raider, and Grim Fandango. A remake of Resident Evil 4 was released on March 24th, 2023 on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Windows, and Xbox Series XS. The remake was also announced for the iPhone 15 Pro to be released between late 2023 and early 2024. In June 2021, the photographer and author Judy Jarasek launched legal proceedings against Capcom for using images from her book Surfaces visual research for artists, architects, and designers without her permission to create textures for multiple games, including Resident Evil 4 and Devil May Cry. The parties reached an undisclosed settlement outside of court in February 2022. Busy weekends are a breeze with American Express Platinum Card. 8 a.m., wait to board plane in the Centurion Lounge. (sighs) Much better. 2 p.m., grab seats for the game. 6 p.m., book an exclusive reservation with Resi Global Dining Access. Right this way. Because the American Express Platinum Card offers access to the Centurion Lounge, must-see live events, and exclusive reservations at renowned restaurants. That's the powerful backing of American Express. See how to elevate your experiences at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Skinny Pop Popcorn. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Oh, so light and crunchy. Skinny Pop Original Popcorn is the snack you've been searching for. Made with just three simple ingredients, popcorn kernels, sunflower oil, and salt. Snacking never felt or tasted so good. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Give yourself permission to snack and pick up Skinny Pop Original Popcorn today. So as we start to wrap this up, and I know... The phrase, one of the best games of all times, is thrown around in most of the episodes we've been creating because they're all the greatest games of all time. We all love them. But I think we really need to talk about what... Hits only, baby. It's only. But we need to talk about what that means, especially in particular to this game. And I think we've reiterated a bunch of times at the end of this episode, but it is that like revamping of the genre. It's taking over from what was fixed cameras almost like in the corners of rooms that were really hard to get around at times into this very action oriented created the third person camera view for kind of the shooter horror mix that we still see today you and i played hours of gears of war we know what it's like to have that kind of over the shoulder stuff and so like having that come from first of all a gamecube game 
into kind of what we have today is is, yeah. is really special. Yeah, I think the most shocking part of it all is that it was developed as a GameCube exclusive mm-hmm. to me because there's so many games that I think get developed in the broader sense of like gaming and influencing gaming as a whole. And then there's like Nintendo specific stuff that they do really well, but no one else really does anything like that. They might draw inspiration from Legend of Zelda, but Legend of Zelda is still just going to be a Nintendo specific thing that they're always able to sort of do what they want to do with and no one else is able to really copy them in that sense. Yes. Resident Evil 4 revamping, deciding to really reinvent their series. One, uh, a big risk, I think, for them because Resident Evil was pretty well established and successful. So going and saying, hey, we want to change up the way that these games sort of operate I think was a interesting risk for them to take with resident evil Four, that third person over the shoulder thing really is just so iconic and yeah, reiterated a bunch throughout the episode, but I mean, think about all the great games that we've gotten that really utilize that just that style of gameplay where the first person viewpoint is fine. I think in, in a lot of games, sure. It's very easy to aim guns and things like that from the first person perspective because it's all very centered. This was a game, though, that wanted to craft a story that you weren't seeing everything from that first person perspective. Mm -hmm. These characters are important. They are outside of the player. The player does control them, sure, but it's, it's, it's seeing the story from a first person perspective into a third person perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that doesn't really make sense, but it's just it's a way of having that story be told and and sort of being like an an invisible follower, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, kind of being like over the shoulder ghost like you're still you still feel almost as if you're Leon, but you feel like you're like influencing the presence of it versus the like any man's hero type thing where you take over and it could be kind of anyone leading it, but it's you doing it. Whereas in that over the shoulder third person, it's like, I'm the shadow that's helping them control them. I'm the shadow that's keeping them safe. Yeah. And you know, one of the games, I don't know if it got brought up, but like uh rockstar does a lot of stuff with this sort of viewpoint mm-hmm. now where it's, you know, grand theft auto four, five red dead redemption one and two, you know, that, that use that same sort of very, I think, gameplay-driven storytelling, mm-hmm. where it is, it is more, it's not just an experience of a story in a video game. Some games really lean into the cinematic aspect of that. But yeah, like real quick decisions that have to be made, being accurate, while also having that sort of outside perspective it it does create unique challenges and it's given us great stories in video games. I think Gears of War, I mean, I know we all love Halo, but Gears of War was just such a fantastic success for the Xbox 360 that I think was really the series that that system needed to kind of keep being a, the powerhouse that it had become. Last of Us, you know, uh, amazing show, amazing games as well. Um, and really, I think have been one of the only successful crossovers into the TV show realm for a video game. And then, of course, Dead Space, not only its own trilogy, but uh, a remake of its own. And, and to influence games like that from a GameCube exclusive, I think is really cool, especially with the GameCube not really being known for great like gritty action type stuff yeah you know being sort of that kitty console nintendo carrying that over basically can't seem to get that monkey off its back but it's you know it's able to do and and make a little headway with resident evil 4 being originally a console exclusive what and let me jump in real quick because i want to talk about the uh capcom 5 that we had referenced earlier in the episode basically capcom had to produce five games for nintendo um, specifically for the GameCube. And this goes back to an earlier relationship that they had. I mean, Mega Man was on uh, the Super Nintendo. 
any of this stuff with Nintendo, like this was a big thing that was bringing in money. And with Sega's rival Genesis kind of bringing in a lot of those third parties, they signed up with Capcom pretty early and kind of brought them in was like, hey, let's make some, make some games for us. And so those five-ish, I'm going to say five-ish games, was PN03. It did okay. Got a 63 out of 100, kind of a sci-fi third-person shooter. Beautiful Joe. Should be called Beautiful Joe. Super fun game. Love. Super different than that of like the Resident Evil look, given that comic booky feel to it all. Um, there's an episode on that there's, if you want to go listen to that. Absolutely. We've talked about it before. One that's pretty interesting is called Dead Phoenix. Um, it was going to come out, but it looks like it got scrapped to become Kid Icarus. Okay. Resident Evil 4, and finally Killer 7, which was an action adventure first person shooter, kind of an on rails, somewhat more gritty. Um, did pretty well as, as, as well, but we've seen this before. We saw this even with, um, if we go going the Halo route, uh, Bungie in 343. Whenever Bungie was kind of wrapping up, you know, Papa Microsoft is like, you got to keep making some stuff. And they signed a deal to make a couple more games. That's where we got, you know, Halo Reach. We got three into ODST, kind of like filling out this contract of five games. We kind of see that into a lot of different publishers, developers, where you sign on for a, a number of titles to create. And then once you've kind of satisfied your contract, you go on. A lot of that is usually either end of life contracts in Bungie's terms or kind of a goodwill contract where you're going to be like, hey, we've worked together really well. Make us some games, we'll make some money. So that's where Resident Evil 4, I know it's super weird. I remember when one of our mutual friends played it and like handed me the, the game. I was like, oh, you should play Resident Evil 4. I'm like, on the GameCube? Wasn't that like a <laughs> PlayStation game people yeah. had? And like Silent Hill was part of that? Like, why is it on the GameCube? And it is a yeah. fantastic game. It, it definitely changed it up. I think 5, even though I played it and enjoyed it, it went way to arcadey shooter wildness, whereas four, like I yeah. think it was the perfect balance of still those horror elements of the earlier series, but mixed in with new tech. Yeah. Five, a lot of fun, a lot of fun mm -hmm. to play. Oh, yeah. And, but, but, you know, it's, I, I feel like they were sort of chasing that zombie arcade, like, yep, shoot them up kind of thing. You know, it's, it, it wasn't, like uh like those old arcade systems like think like holding the pistol literally pointing them at the screen where it just sort of mm -hmm. brings you to a new little thing you got to shoot the guys before they duck under whatever it almost was like that to me in, yes. in a lot of sequences and it was it was because there was just so many buildings and things where they'd just pop up really quick and i i know that's a little bit of resident evil's thing because there is that horror scary element but for whatever reason five particularly not scary kind of just mowing everybody down as they pop up now um, i will say though that style game then they jump to six and everyone forgets about six because six was awful five was at least fun but really wasn't yeah. in resident evil to a point six tried to be like what if we went back to our roots and brought almost everyone back for a game and it just was so scatterbrained and all over the place and then we get the reinvention with seven with biohazard um which again reinvented it we go to first person we go to someone who has no training in this stuff like leon did or like chris redfield did with this stuff this is kind of just joe schmo in a territory type thing kind of the the same thing we kind of feel and like like outlast um, kind of journalistic standpoint to it. And mm -hmm. it, it, it really reinvented it. It made its own game again. Then you have uh, 8 with Village come out. And, and they've really done... Capcom has done very, very well with reinventing those pockets of Resident Evil. There's stumbles, for sure. There's stumbles throughout the series, but they've done well with that. And then they've done expertly with, I think, every re-release every kind of kind of redub or redo that they've had with these remasters or, or kind of re-released ones they've brought them to the modern era and one two three and now four have all gotten these amazing revamps that make them feel like a new game yeah and and i think that that is a very difficult thing to do to keep that stuff fresh um you've got sort of like two remasters within this right where it's mm -hmm. two big ones where it's like it's, originally it's coming out for the GameCube and then we get like this great 
new take on it with the Wii, and then you know, of course, the the most recent Resident Evil Four was very well received, and it's cool for them, I think, to be able to do that um, because doing remake, doing remakes and remasters and uh, sort of putting them out there, throwing them out there. Uh, I think we talked about this in an episode that we recorded last week where, you know, it's just sometimes they're just slapping the, the label on there and just basically doing a port. And it feels like they at least want to do these a little bit more than just a port, just a, a way to extend the life cycle of the game. They actually think about the integration and think about what can they do to modernize these games that were successful. And I think that that's a really great way to look at it because Resident Evil 4 was really well received. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it it's a game that you want to die with the GameCube necessarily because the the GameCube, I, I have a lot of great memories of playing GameCube games as well as N64 and and even a few Wii games too, although not not my favorite console. It's just it, it's giving people a chance to play really great games that we started to get in those two thousands, and and making sure that the care of the games doesn't die with just the original release, and I think that's what makes these games special. Yeah, it it really is, and it. I know that the horror genre is not for everyone, but I think this became kind of the first in this series that was it accessible. I think it's the way that sometimes people talk about like non-gamers joining the sphere. Well, this is kind of like non-horror or shooter-specific gamers coming over to here and, and merging those groups. And I understand the you know push against change when they're like, that's not true horror. You created the genre and you're destroying it. It's like, well... It's just kind of reinventing it. If if you just come out with the same thing over and over again, sure, fans might love it because it keeps kicking up a little nostalgia each time if it stays the same. Mm -hmm. But you kind of got to reinvent. You got to keep changing with it. And I think Resident Evil, out of really any of the horror genres of the time, had done it expertly. I think Silent Hill stumbled. I think a lot of the other games that time just didn't keep up. or if they did, they tried and reinvent themselves. They came out later. I mean, we see Dead Space found its space, its, its space, found its kind of way in there of that mixture of that horror ness aspect of it with the third person shooter and kind of that like needing to find the different weapons and things and guns that work with it. Um, even Gears of War, if we want to talk about that as kind of being in a horror ish genre, it's very gothic horror in a way of like these like creatures coming out from the earth taken over and like having to fight this resistance uh it's it's done it's done well and I, and i think most of the games yeah. i've really played are spawns of this type of game yeah no i i think that it's a great it, it's a zombie horror thing but it has a little bit of a, like an apocalyptic feel mm-hmm. to it which is very common in the zombie genre sure but there's like really being scary about it. And then there's like, like that Gears of War style where I don't know that there's necessarily a moment in Gears of War where you're really scared. You're just kind of like, you know, these things are going to come out of the ground. Okay. Let's get them. You know, I, I think that resident evil has a lot more of that than like silent Hill, which is super creepy walking around in these awful places. Mm-hmm. And then you turn the corner and there's just a scary monster that you have to fight now. Um, that that looks super hideous. You know, I I think that this does a really great job of of keeping that scary but not too scary, actiony but not too actiony, and just just a really great blend. Now, I was a little surprised. I don't know about you, just to see how well the Wii version of this was received. But maybe that's my own bias against. I think Wii games because I just didn't really love the motion control thing to me was always a gimmick. It was never really like I felt comfortable playing that console. Yeah. Um, in that sense. And so resident evil, of course, like making sure to incorporate, I think some Wii things into it, but, but not totally 
leaning into it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like that would make it sit in a weird place, but it didn't with with critics. But how do you feel about that? No, I, I think that's I think that's exactly it is like. I'm very biased against the Wii. I think Wii Sports, Wii Sports Resort, all the kind of ones that were party games work really well with the kind of pointing and clicking and swinging and slashing. It's really why I never yeah. played like The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. It's why I never really played in these more serious quote unquote games. I just didn't think it was that great of a piece of tech over it being gimmicky. But if people are loving it with Resident Evil 4, and I can see that, where it is a slower paced game where you can kind of aim with the Wii Mote and kind of fire at the villagers, fire at the regenerators, fire at all these different creatures that you yeah. find. I think this might be the perfect game for it. That slowed down version of a shooter where you can like, there's, I mean, there's definitely like pop outs and jump scares with it, but like be able to take your time with it and not have that Call of Duty esque, like bang, 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 run, 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 bang, 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 like having that to it, but being able to have a slower element to it, I think works. If I still had my Wii around, I might go and find myself a copy of this and try and play that through and see if it's interesting <laughs> with it. Um, because I think it worked with the GameCube. Yeah. I think it works the modern consoles. So I think it would be fun to try that out. Yeah. Yeah, I've got an extra Wii. Maybe I'll have to just drop it on off oh, at place. your place. We'll, right. we'll make this a real, real thing. A real thing? But yeah, you know, it's 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 funny because if you've listened to this podcast for a while, like, you know, my favorite Legend of Zelda is Skyward Sword, and that's big in the motion controls. But But yeah, I think it takes just such a really specific game designed specifically for the Wii to really make that work in my opinion and that's going to be sacrilegious I think to a lot of our listenership because for a lot of them I know that the Wii really was like their N64 like that it was it was their kid growing up kind of console where they just have a lot of great memories but for me yeah I mean I think that I would rather play the GameCube version um, totally skip the Wii version and then get back to just normal console gaming and that's you know what also leads me to my next question the vr uh remake for this gets criticism for basically like keeping people from being pervy Mm -hmm. but vr is another really interesting path i feel like for a game like this especially with the emphasis on the third person perspective yeah and then you bring this into a, a vr thing where that it's just two totally at odds ideas to me where it's one game is is really there where you're over the shoulder and and vr is there to put you in the game i don't know how do you feel about that i, I i'm kind of in the middle i'm kind of like a no comment kind of thing when it comes to these vr remakes we got vr skyrim we got vr fallout we got all these different like vr ports that here's what i'll say i'm not a huge proponent of vr i don't really care about it too much but i think if you can make something that can still be interesting and keep the essence of a game that you're porting it from more power to you and I think if there are like safety or like weird precautions you got to kind of take for that type of creepy stuff, sure. So, yeah. Sounds good. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but the thing with VR for me is I just don't feel like the games are quite there yet. And yeah. the VR systems are so expensive. Like a, a VR, if, if I wanted to get like the PlayStation's VR system, it's more than a PlayStation 5, I believe. And it's like, as far as the games actually go, Am I really getting that much better of an experience? I don't necessarily want to play Skyrim in the first person when I'm playing it with a controller. I don't see myself wanting to to play first person and and just get that viewpoint because it was always it, it it looked sloppy to me anyway. So that's sort of my thing with the VR games as well. So I I was just surprised to see you know some of that criticism for the the VR one to not really be focused on that, but haven't played it. So can't really tell, but as always really great episode. Um, yeah, probably like a, an eight out of 10 for me on this game. I think I've talked about it enough for you to understand why, but what about you? I'll be short and sweet. Play the remaster. 
mostly because, and here's my rating, Ashley has a better AI that is not dumb, that will follow you, and is so much yeah. better than the original, and that's the only big gripe I'll give is the AI in the first one. Having followers or damsels in distress sucks in almost every game, so having yeah. the update to her AI in this, play the remaster. It's fantastic. I'm going to give that a remaster out of 10. Excellent point. Totally forgot to mention that. Um, and that was such a huge sticking point for people. I think that that almost makes the original version like unplayable. If you wanted to go back and just with how long it's been and how much better AI is, if you, yes. if you are used to the modern AI companions, uh, yeah, there's almost no way. Exactly. And then when you talk about in a retrospective, still a fun game. We're not patient gamers anymore. We can't deal with that. We've got so many other options. We got to play something <laughs> that's just better, smarter, and it's just made for the today's standards. So definitely check the remastered out or the Wii version, the two best, some might say. Um, check those two out because that's definitely what I'd recommend. Research for this episode was done by Alex Kennel and Derek Baker. The intro and outro music was given to us by our friend Evan Barr, and our lovely artwork was provided by Aaron Shattuck. Lovely people, as always. You can also check us out if you want to support us at our Patreon, patreon.com slash finish the fight. We've got some physical and digital rewards, as well as a couple other goodies for you. I want to thank a few select members today with Snide T-Bird, Nick Hyman, and Anthony Gooch. Thank you so much for your support. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, please drop us a review. It helps us out a lot, and we love to hear from you. You can also, if you're listening on Spotify, participate in our Q&As. We read them all. Maybe we'll publish your answers. Check us out on Twitch. You can see me at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That is twitch.tv slash sourman70, as well as Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. You can follow this podcast on Instagram and Twitter. We are also on Discord. It's free to join. There's a link in the description below, and we'd love to see you there. And with that, this has been our coverage of Resident Evil 4. Are there any other Golden Age games we should be looking at? Are there any other things that have like changed the way that we play games today? Let us know on our socials. Let us know through Carrier Pigeons. Let us know through virus transfers in creepy Spain towns. No. That's no, the best way to get in any touch of with those us. last two things. <laughs> Just social media, please. <laughs> Whatever you'd like. And with that, no. Nope. I am nope. your host Alex Kendall and I am your host Derek who likes to be contacted via social. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. <laughs>